it's like when we started like iphones weren't a thing facebook yeah. didn't exist like none of this stuff was around my kids were still really small um you know now they've graduated college so the world changes from a healthcare perspective you know healthcare has always in embraced technology you know there's x-rays there's mris there's c scans um, all, all sorts of technology but they were the, really the last industry to embrace data Hello, welcome to the Better Outcome Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Each episode, we bring you a conversation with leaders across the healthcare industry, exploring topics ranging from new treatment techniques and interventions to novel service delivery methods and business models. And now your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions, a leader in patient engagement and retention strategy. Let's explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Well, hello again. Welcome to another episode of the Better Outcomes Show. I'm your host, Rafi Salazar with Rehab U Practice Solutions. And if you want to discover what healthcare should be, even if you think healthcare is broken beyond repair, then I invite you to go check out the book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. We are coming up on its one-year anniversary of being published. The book explores what true... Uh, person-centered care should be basically from the back of the cover here it says through an explanation of both clinical research and real-life examples and cases the book outlines and supports a vision of a new health care where skilled competent and caring clinicians care for engaged patients to promote better clinical outcomes deliver unmatched satisfaction and build lasting relationships so that's really I know we talk about technology a lot in the, on the podcast and innovation and new ways of delivering care or tracking care or promoting better outcomes, better clinical outcomes. But it all comes from, at least in my opinion, from the viewpoint of addressing it from the fundamentally the, the best or the most valuable thing a clinician brings to the table, which is the human element of healthcare. So all this stuff about technology and artificial intelligence and using data to make decisions is all great and it all should be looked at as almost like a force multiplier to our care. But really, in my mind, when I look at innovations happening in the healthcare space, what gets me excited is the fact that these innovations, these solutions, are freeing us up, as I mentioned in a couple podcast episodes previously, like it frees us up to waste time where it truly matters, which is building relationships, real meaningful relationships with our patients that we can then leverage on their behalf to help them achieve a higher quality of life, uh, improve their clinical outcomes. I'm from the occupational therapy world, so I would say improve their occupational performance. Um, but that's the <clears throat> that should be the whole the whole idea. We're implementing technology not so that we can just become more efficient and, like I said in the last episode, double down on these archaic models of reimbursement and revenue models in healthcare, but really to open the doors to value-based reimbursement schemes or, or whatever whatever we're able to do that allows us as clinicians to build those meaningful relationships to tap into the human experience that is healthcare. So anyways, if that's something you're interested in reading about and taking maybe even listening, you've listened to a few episodes on the podcast and you want to know what what's kind of driving it all, the book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare is where you can find that. If you go to book.betteroutcomes.show, you can see some of the reviews. There's a couple of videos of me talking about some of the topics on the that, that we cover in the book and then there's links to either buy it on Amazon or on Audible. It's in all those places. So Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare can be found at book.betteroutcomes.show. All right. This week, speaking of technology and innovation, we are taking a bit of a dive into the world of digital therapeutics. So I don't know <clears throat> if you're... Um, if you're a clinician listening to this and you're you're you see all of the things happening, all the devices, all the technologies, all the softwares coming to market, and you're trying to differentiate between some are saying they're FDA approved and some are not, and all of what's the difference between a consumer good or a consumer wearable and something that can be used in a medical space as a medical device? Well, it all comes down to well, not all comes down to, but there's a big piece of that that can be uh, associated with 
digital therapeutics. And my guest this week, uh, RJ Kedzioria, from, uh, he's the co-founder and partner of Estenda Solutions. He'll tell you a little bit about his background in the intro when we first get started in the conversation. But he's been helping build and develop uh, digital therapeutics for quite some time. He's been in the space for, I want to say, 20 years or something like that. So he's got a wealth of experience with the the both the development side, but then also the making something or get classifying something as a digital therapeutic. So he defines what digital therapeutic is and how that's different than, you know, the Garmin watch or, or whatever wearable, you know, consumer wearable you're, you're using to track your fitness or whatever. Um, and we talked a little bit about this conversation kind of widespread, a little bit on the side of, okay, maybe you're a technology company or a device company and what are the steps to become a digital therapeutic? How should that fall into your go-to-market strategy? So I work and have worked with a number of uh, technology companies or innovative healthcare companies in the musculoskeletal space, and maybe they've had a good D to C um, product or solution or whatever, and now they're looking at taking it to the next level in healthcare, and that we're in the middle of pivoting some of their offerings to become more medically based and go becoming a digital therapeutic is a very good way to do that it takes a lot of effort a lot of resources a lot of research and all that as uh, rj explains but um there are people too that i've worked with that are starting uh maybe they've got a, a piece of software or some code or an app or you know some kind of artificial intelligence tool and they're looking at should we just go to market or should we become a digital therapeutic first? Is it like an either and or both and? Um, or do we focus entirely on going to market and then getting classified as a digital therapeutic later? RJ kind of explains what some of his clients have done, shapes some of my thinking on the topic. And then we talked a little bit about the impact of digital therapeutics, how it's going to improve access, the way we should think about employing them within the healthcare sphere. Again, I'm a big fan of not doubling down on this fee-for-service, like this archaic, broken model of healthcare, but really leveraging the technology and the scalability of digital health to allow us as organizations and providers to explore some of these alternative payment models in a way that is still profitable, but that also increases the access and utilization of our clinicians. So wide-ranging discussion. Hopefully you find it helpful, insightful, and entertaining. But without further ado, here is RJ from, um, from Estenda Solutions talking about specifically digital therapeutics. Well, hey, RJ, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me today. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to diving into the whole world of digital therapeutics. But before we go into that topic, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and kind of what got you into doing what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I started out way back when computer science degree came up through the, the software development, the programming ranks, um, developing solutions quickly realized it's not always about technology and it's really about the people and the processes. So that drove my career through project management, program management, general management. And then in the early 2000s, working for big consulting, um, realized I could go off and do this on my own um, and do it cheaper um, yeah. and, and probably better in a lot of situations. Uh, so we started uh, Estenda. Uh, the company I, I still run today, uh, 20 years ago now. We just passed our Holy 20th smokes, anniversary. Congrats. And thank you. Uh, it's been quite a journey when I can talk about decades. It's yeah. It's always it's always interesting. Um, but yeah, we've been focusing on digital health, software development, data analytics uh, for the last 20 years. Yeah. So you've obviously been doing this for a while, like you said, decades. Um, what's the biggest change or challenge you've seen arising from like kind of the, just the digitalization of everything, including healthcare? And what has that kind of done for, kind of, I guess, your work and what you've seen happening in the industry? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great question. And as I reflect on this over the years, as we hit our 20th anniversary and really thinking about that, it's like when we started, like iPhones weren't a thing. Facebook yeah. didn't exist. Like none of this stuff was around. My kids were still really small. Um, you know, now they've graduated college, so world of changes from a healthcare perspective, you know, healthcare has always in, embraced technology. You know, there's x-rays, there's MRIs, there's C scans, 
um, all, all sorts of technology, but they were the, really the last industry to embrace data. Um, and, and 20 years ago, data was scarce. EMRs existed. Um, we were lucky early on to work with military, healthcare, and government organizations that had the electronic oh, yeah. medical records. But not until you know it was mandated did it really come on board. So early in the 2000s, data was scarce. And when we were driving decision-making, it was how do you make decisions on limited data? Fast forward 20 years, almost everybody has electronic medical records now. It's how do we bring this together? Um, I wear an aura ring. You know, the Apple Watch tracks all sorts of information. There's just so much data that is available now. So we've gone from basis, data scarcity to an overwhelming amount yeah. of information. And it's now it's how do you drive information out of the noise? You know, how do you how do you make decisions on what's important in that data as opposed to trying to figure out that limited amount of information? Now it's too much information. So, yeah. And then we've moved, you know, digital health in general. You know, we, I would say we've been doing digital health before it was called digital health, but now it's it's really starting to be recognized for what it's capable of. And that's where uh, this this term digital therapeutics came about. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it is interesting for um, I mean, maybe 10 years ago when I was at the VA as a clinician and we were doing some projects uh, around like patient engagement and stuff like the the data, you know, the VA just had tons and tons of patients, tons and tons of instances and encounters and somewhere somebody was like logging all this data. But it was like even back then it was like, well, we've got these servers that have like thousands of patients, you know, encounters and notes and all that kind of stuff. But even then they were trying to figure out like, how do we make sense of, you know, terabytes of information, like needling through it and finding what's, what's important and what's not important. And, um, and part of that is because at least it, the way i I saw it was like, we built these systems and it was like data was one of those things that, oh, we can gather the data. So we're just going to do it. <laughs> but there was like no rhyme or reason to like, okay, we want to code it or we want to segment it or we want to do something to make it useful down the line. It was just one of those, like, we have this ability now to gather data. So we're going to gather data. Right. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and healthcare is still somewhat there, you know, yeah. medical records, everybody has them, but they're very much driven around collecting data for billing. Yes, exactly. Not for, not for care management. And that's slowly changing as we advance and we get a handle on how to manage all of this data. But, you know, if you look at a, a patient record, a particular patient record, the way EMRs tend to work is a lot of that's going to be duplicated information. Yeah. So how, how do you bring the power of technology um, to solve those problems? Yeah. Well, let's back up. And you mentioned the term digital therapeutics. So for those of us who have, have no clear understanding what that means, uh, what is that term? What does it mean? How are you using it? <laughs> yeah, it, it is a relatively new term, um, probably six or seven years ago. Uh, there, there's a group out there called the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. It, it only started, I think, in 2017, 2018. Okay. We're really driving this idea. And a digital therapeutic is an evidence-based, clinically validated digital health application designed to treat and manage a patient directly. So you, can, you are sharing information with your care providers, but it's really designed to treat you as the individual patient. And the way I think about it is there's um, 300,000 digital health applications by, yeah. by some count, just tons of digital health applications out there, but they just don't have that level of clinical validation, the evidence to say that they really do work. They might work, but nobody has taken the time and the effort to do that study. And to bring it back, I think of it as, you know, you go to the pharmacy and you can buy all sorts of vitamins, minerals, supplements, they might work. There's some evidence that some of those work. And that's the, that's how I think of as, as the general digital health applications. They yeah. you know, can provide value. But then there are medications, drugs that have gone through extensive clinical trial, FDA validation to prove that they work and the FDA or other global regulatory bodies have reviewed that work um, to make sure it was done properly. And that's the idea around a digital therapeutic. It has that elevated status. It is evidence-based. It has gone through clinical trials. It's gone through an FDA level review um, to, to be able to say, yes, this does work. And in a lot of cases, those the idea around a 
digital therapeutic is that it's prescribed by a physician and can be reimbursed by the insurance. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point. I, I wonder how much of that, like the, the fact that there's a lot out there, kind of like the supplement world is probably that one studies are expensive to do, but also like just the proliferation of them, you know, like maybe 10 years ago, the idea of like a wear, like a Garmin watch or an Apple watch is like tracking your O2 and your, your heart rate and your sleep cycle. Like that technology was thousands of dollars, you know, like, and now they're just, you can get them for a couple hundred bucks. Um, so we've gotten this, we went from an area of like just getting that de- kind of data was expensive and kind of out of reach of most people. And now they're basically it's consumer goods that can do this. Um, so you've got like a huge proliferation of all of these things that technically fall into the digital health world. But like you said, a lot of them are supplements. And it's interesting to see like studies that have been done that I've seen a couple like around the use of wearables, for example, it's like, okay, well, if you use wearables, we we found this correlation to like increased activity level or decreased obesity or risk of cardio disease or whatever it is. Um, but they're just looking at the broad spectrum and not like this specific device, you know, decrease the risk of falls by X percent or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you you said it, it's correlation, not causation. Yeah. You know, there, there's all sorts of ideas and you see this a lot of in, in the public media uh, the, the general media media that it's like correlation it, it's not it's not saying it causes it but you know there's some association between these two things is it meaningful we don't know yeah so and i mean i guess that's the kind of the biggest differentiator then between like your standard digital health tool and digital therapeutic is just that this one has been you know the digital therapeutic has been validated we've got evidence to support that if you use this specific device for this specific condition with this specific patient population you know we we've got some efficacy there that we can rely on based on the evidence correct yes yeah it, it makes a difference and and that's the the key differentiator it's that it's gone through that, that exercise and and they do take time it does add cost to bring the the solution to to market um, but the idea is that, you know, so you think of, of you as a consumer and you go to the Apple store, the Google Play store, and you're going to buy an app. People tend to not pay a lot of money for those apps, even though they might be like a dollar. It's like, yeah. oh, I don't want to spend a dollar on this you know, little app. Um, so in the idea of digital therapeutics and, and prescribed therapeutics where your doctor is saying, OK, here, go use this. Uh, you can get reimbursed by the insurance company at a much higher rate. So there's definitely a, a business model and a business driver for companies yeah. out there to go the digital therapeutic route. Um, but yes, it does take you know longer and, and have more overhead associated with it. Yeah. And what I'd imagine too, there's probably a little bit more of a um like a patient uh engagement or utilization of it if the doctor says, Oh, you could get yourself a wearable and track your steps or your activity level versus Hey, I've got this device. You've got this issue. I want you to use this for 30 days, 60 days, whatever. We'll track it. We'll we'll use this to kind of treat and manage this this disease, and then we'll kind of see how we're do- going. I imagine, you know, option B there, where the doctor's giving you this specific thing and telling you to to use it for the specific issue, is going to have a lot higher adherence than like, oh well, you can get a wearable or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, it absolutely does. Um your doctor, your your care provider, you know, the nurse practitioner you're seeing is a trusted resource. Um, and, and there's something called a sentinel effect. Um, yeah. And it's basically the idea if somebody is observing and following your behavior, you're going to tend to track that more and be more engaged and do it more. So if you have that trusted provider, you know, saying, hey, do this, and they're going to be able to see this data, people tend to do it, do it more often, better, be more engaged with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I didn't even really think about the whole, the the cost and the time that it takes to put one of these things in place as well. So I, I imagine it's kind of like a drug timeline wise, right? Like how many years are we talking from, okay, we've got this idea for this digital therapeutic or this future digital therapeutic to, okay, we're going to market. I mean, we're talking what, five years or more just to get through the the development, the the studies, the validation, the approvals. Yeah, it's it, you. You mentioned the drug world, and the drug world. Yeah. I think it's like twenty years now to, yeah, to get something, really and, and probably over a billion dollars to to go through the full 
cycle kind of thing. Fortunately, doing things in, in the digital world um, is easier. It, it still does take time to do that. And I've, I've heard um, in, in general from, you know, the start, the inception to, you know, on market with FDA approval of like three to seven year yeah. time frame. But there's definitely strategies you can use to, to mitigate that and be able to hit market and, and drive value faster. You know, so in the beginning and early stages, let's get a product out the door that's not necessarily classified as a digital therapeutic. Um, yeah. You're going to market it a little differently. You're not going to you know, make the same claims once it has gone through FDA validation. But let's get it to market, get that user feedback and, and start driving you know, revenue earlier. Yeah. Is there anything you need to do, I would assume, between like, okay, this is a, like, you have to differentiate. This is what we put out. This was, let's call it 1.0, the option 1.0. We tested that in the market. And then now it's a, we've gone through the reviews. It's going to be a digital therapeutic. Like, I'm assuming there's maybe some kind of features or benefits or there's something that's got to be done to kind of differentiate it from like this thing that you can get off the shelf at, you know, Radio Shack or something. <laughs> yeah, Are there any Radio Shack. Shacks there's, around? There's an, old, there's an old reference for you. Yeah. Um, but I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, there, there is. And, and it really starts with the software development process. How are you okay. building this solution? You know, so when you're you know, manufacturing a drug, you know, there's a lot of history and data and process that has to be followed and collected. Same thing in, in the software world. You know, we have a very well-structured quality management process. The FDA, not to, to start getting techy, but, you know, the FDA is, is the part 820 process. And we happen to be ISO 13485 certified, which just says we have a well-documented software development process, quality management process that we follow. And, and we get audited um, regularly to make sure that we are following this process. So in the end, when you do go to the FDA, you have the history, the information around the, how the product was created, how it was tested, um, and the evidence to be able to say, yes, we've, we've actually done this. And with the digital therapeutic, it's gone through those clinical trials. So you know, a, a minute ago, I referenced the idea, let's get something out and get it to market. On well, those early stages, it's like, OK, we haven't done those extensive clinical trials yeah. yet. So, you know, we think this works, but we're not sure. Let's do those um, early clinical trials. And we have at Estenda some PhDs on staff to help drive, you know, those clinical trials and, and get that information and analyze the data. And then as it progresses, okay, now let's do these, the full blown clinical trials. Yeah. And are you using like the initial go to market? Maybe it's a consumer device or something like that. That initial data that you're gathering from that to kind of lay the foundation for what will be a future like let's call it a randomized double blind study or something like that? Or is it, um, is it totally separate? Like you already kind of know how you want to set up the study or what you think you're going to you actually be looking for. And then all this other data that you're getting from the consumers is kind of just secondary or answer, like it helps build the case, but it's not laying the foundation. Yeah, it's, it's more building the case, understanding what works in the product, what doesn't and helps you adjust and um, you know, we, we follow an, an agile methodology, which really means yeah. it's just iterative. We're constantly improving on the product in those early clinical trial studies with smaller numbers of people. It helps drive those changes Bigger, and then helps yeah. you plan out when you do get to that randomized, you know, clinical controlled trial kind of thing, which is the gold standard uh, these days. So. Yeah, yeah but I, I imagine this type of I mean, obviously doing any kind of like rigorous uh, scientific study or clinical study involves a lot of capital and human resources. Like how are startups funding this? Is this one of those things like they're just raising capital from VCs to try to put these through? Or are they partnering with universities on grant funding to try to make sure it's um, non-biased, so to speak? Like, you know, if you get a, a study like, okay, you know, Rafi's ABC company also has Rafi's digital therapeutic and Rafi paid for all of it. So you know, like imagine there's something like you want to make sure it's academically rigorous as well, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and the answer is all of the above. Yeah. Um, you know, as as a startup and you're out there and you're you're trying to, you know, drive the development of the solution, you know, yes, partnering with a, an academic medical institution, really good. Um, you know, you're just gonna have a lot of value from that, um, some objectivity from that. But you can also go to pharmaceutical companies. 
they're very much um, engaged in the idea of, and sometimes I've heard it, the digital pill. Yeah. Uh, so how can we bring this to, to market as well? So yeah, they, they are very interested in that as well. A challenge in the pharmaceutical industry is, you know, the cost of a digital health app versus an, an actual drug is, yeah. is almost a rounding error. You know, so take yeah. a drug, a new drug to market, it's like a billion dollars with, you know, several billions of dollars in potential revenue. Digital health app isn't going to cost you a billion dollars to develop and put out there. Like, you know, hopefully you'll make a billion dollars yeah. off of it. But yeah. We haven't seen that in the digital health world quite yet. So there's definitely interest in, in the farmer world, um, but you, you have to really drive that. Um, and then VCs, yes, they're, they're interested in all sorts of opportunities along those lines. Um, unfortunately, this year, things have taken a little, little bit of a step back in, in the digital health world, but everything's cyclical. It'll, it'll yeah. come back in the, in the next year or two. I was out at the, the health conference in, in Vegas a, a couple of weeks ago, and, and there's a lot of excitement about just what's possible in, with digital health and technology these days. Yeah. What's, the, what's been the biggest driving factor for the pullback? Has it just been the interest rates kind of keeping capital, you know, close to, close to people's chests or, or is there something else kind of driving some of the, the yeah, pullback? Yeah, it's a combination of, of coming out of COVID where, you know, telehealth in, in, was a big in deal, yeah. was just like went through the roof. Yeah. Um, but everybody sort of pulled back from that. So there's that. And then just general um, economic trends. Um, as, as interest rates have been driving through the roof, so everybody sort of pulled back a little bit. But it, it, I truly believe it's cyclical and it's just going to come back around. Yeah, yeah. And there's always ups and downs, right? So um, one of the one of the things that I'm thinking about now that we've been talking about what it takes, all of the the work, the effort, the time, the capital that it takes to take something to become a digital therapeutic. Like, how does this affect things like? access, equity, all of those kind of buzzwords we've been hearing about in, in not just healthcare, but it, it definitely affects healthcare as well. Like all of this work, all of this time, all this energy adds an added cost to the device, to the tool, to the solution. At what point does it become like a cost prohibitive thing or an issue for maybe people in lower uh, lower socioeconomic status or don't have the, the same access to, to that type of care? Is that something we're concerned about or is there like a plan for that? And I guess maybe in, in payers or, or regulatory uh, world to try to make sure that even though we're doing all of this work on the front end, that's expensive to make sure it's a valid product that everybody will benefit from it at some point. Mm -hmm. And I was at the, uh, again, the health conference a couple of weeks ago, there was a major topic of discussion, just the yeah. idea of access to care, um, equity, equity in that major topic. I think digital health and, and digital therapeutics really helps that. Um, so there are costs associated with it, but uh, a major target for digital therapeutics is, is mental health. Oh yeah. There are yeah. not enough mental health professionals in the world. Um, my wife happens to be a pediatric nurse in, in the Philadelphia area, major metropolitan area. There, there are, you know, pediatric psychologists, people that are trained to take care of, of kids and, and teens. But you go into the rural United States, yeah, there are gonna be less of those. Two hours to the nearest available. one, right? Yeah. Right. So if you can use the digital technology, digital health applications, digital therapeutics to give people access to the care and treatment that they need and they deserve, um, it, it helps bridge that gap. Um, you know, you hear a lot about just, okay, who has access to smartphones? And, and that is very true. That, that is an, an issue. Um, but that's changing more and more cost and price of the, the smartphones that, that drive a lot of these solutions are coming down in price. And then with the idea of, of digital therapeutics, where the cost is the insurance company is paying for it, um, helps out, out that helps out that patient. Um, interestingly, here in the US, there, there is a challenge of being uh, the insurance companies reimbursing for digital therapeutics that hasn't quite caught on as much as one is, as would hope there is legislation going through through Congress now to, to try and really drive the idea of, of that reimbursement. Um, Germany has, has passed um, some extensive legislation that sort of is being upheld as the gold standard way of doing this. And when it gets through the regulatory process, it's also tied to, okay, now you're going to get reimbursement for this as well. 
And that's sort of a separate thing here in the US. It's like, okay, you can get through the FDA review process. Yeah. Now there's a whole other process to get reimbursed. Whether or not you're going to get paid, yeah. Um, so that, that's that's a, a challenge, but it, it's definitely, when we talk about access and, and equity to care, um, digital health scales. Um, someone at the conference said, you can't birth our way out of out of the problems we have in healthcare. We can't, there's just not enough people that we can bring yeah. to bear fast enough to the, pro, the, to the challenge. So, yeah. And the other, the other sort of challenge in healthcare, in, in clinical studies, in, in trials, in, you know, particularly in AI, there's a problem in AI and bias. It's like the data that you train the AI. Exactly. On, yeah. You know, is, is, you know, the, the rural America is not going to be, you know, as well represented, you know, um, there. So if we can move to this digital world, particularly in those clinical trials, then you can pull in more people more easily. Um, and then that drives care all around. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. I remember I was talking to somebody the other day about AI and they said they they brought up that same point. It never really, I never really thought about it. Like, oh, you're using data to train these models. And if all your data is from, you know, three or four major metropolis cities in a, in in the area or in the, in the in one country, you're missing out on a lot of generalizable results across all kinds of populations, right? Different ethnicities and cultures and, and all of that. It's It's interesting. Not something you would think of initially. <laughs> no, no, and and it's it is a lot of that research is driven, unfortunately, by white males. That is changing very quickly, but that data is Caucasian white male, and and so that when it then goes to a different population, you see where the AI don't perform as well, and, and so now it's you know people are definitely looking at it and analyzing it and aware of it. So that is changing, changing quickly, which is good. Yeah. Um, so the, on the issue of like paying for it, obviously in the United States is a totally different ball game. Cause we've got third party payers that are doing that, but you would imagine at some level, like, especially with this move to trying to get away from this fee for service and more towards a value based model of reimbursement that, that payers would wake up to the fact that, oh, this thing, this solution costs less, it uses less manpower. And hopefully if it's been validated and we see that, you know, it's gone through the studies and we can show and demonstrate efficacy that it's a cheaper, uh, effective solution than what we've been doing. Right. Yes, it, I, absolutely. It's, and we have to move the, the U S healthcare system from sick care yeah. to, to well care. <clears throat> so. Yeah, trying to trying to an ounce of prevention is is worth two pounds of cure, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Lose lose you know ten percent of your body weight, and you're going to get healthier. Yeah, um, and it doesn't even have to be that much. Lose some weight, you will get healthier. So move, you will get healthier. You don't have to <laughs> exactly. exercise necessarily. Move, you know, walk, you know, uh, park a little further away from the store, and you know, walk the parking lot. Those things make a difference. Yeah, cool deal. Um, Anything we've missed in regards to to digital therapeutics and the like that you want to cover? Um, yeah, we touched the the, the major points yeah. kind of thing. There's there's definitely opportunity there. Um, reimbursement is is the biggest challenge, but that yeah. that's being addressed. Um, go out and and look up the the digital therapeutic um, legislation that's going through Congress. Um, you know, ultimately, it, it's it's not about the technology though. It's it's about the people and the processes that are driving all yeah. of this. So um, heavily in, involved in, in the startup world and love to see what everybody out there is doing. So it's awesome. awesome. Um, well, just leading into that then, where can people find out more about you, your work, Estenda, and we'll link to all that in the in the show notes after you give yeah, us Yeah, our, our website is, is probably the easiest site, uh, estenda.com, E-S-T-E-N-D-A.com. We're at a bunch of the, the conferences. Follow us on, on LinkedIn. That's usually where we're always posting, you know, we'll be at this conference, that conference, you know, yeah. love to hear people's stories, love to just have a conversation um, and see what's going on out there. So it's been great. Awesome. Cool deal. Well, RJ, thanks so much, man. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. This has been fabulous. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with RJ talking about digital therapeutics and all that that term entails. I think it's interesting. <clears throat> I was talking to somebody the other day about healthcare, about the industry, about innovation. 
and they said something along the lines of, "Well, healthcare is you know it takes healthcare forever to adopt new technology or to or, you know to implement new innovations, and and why is that?" And part of that is, I think, is twofold. Obviously, just the discussion about what it takes to become a digital therapeutic, as you heard, I mean, it's not maybe not as expensive as becoming a drug with the FDA, but there's still trials that need to be taking place. There's regulatory procedures. It takes a lot of time and effort for something to be classified as a digital therapeutic. And why does that matter? Well, because the way our system is set up here in the U.S. in particular in order for providers to be able to get some ROI for those tools, right, they need to be able to bill for them, they need to be able to submit charges or codes based off of the use of that device or that technology. So it's kind of this almost a self-feeding loop where innovation requires time in order to get, you know, this this special classification so it can be billed for, and then clinicians need to be able to bill for it, which means they need to be able to get reimbursed for it. And based off of our current model of fee-for-service, well, then you have to figure out the CPT codes and the charges and, and all of that. Like the money drives a lot of it, as opposed to some of these other areas of technology that might not be clinically related at all, like say scheduling, for example, apps or you know scheduling apps or calendar apps or something like that, um, or messaging has been one of those things that's that's come into the, like that ancillary healthcare space relatively quickly because we just make you know my my generation maybe we um, maybe a little bit older and and the recent ones like we can book everything on our phones we want to be able to book an appointment with your uh, with the clinic online on our phone without having to call the office so stuff like that has been making its way and that does help some and it does alleviate some pressure maybe the administrative burden but it all comes down to, in my mind, the way we pay for healthcare and the way we regulate healthcare. Now, obviously, I'm not advocating that we totally take the FDA and throw it out the window, as some people, some people have suggested. Um, but it does mean that we should really take a a real good hard look at the requirements that we put in place for some of these tools, these technologies, these innovations, based off of the risk and mitigating it and all that. Versus what is, like, what is, the, when I was doing work with, with folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities, one of, a good friend of mine, former business partner, Dan Howell, used to say, well, there's a difference between, you know, discovering the difference between what is risk, like, too risky, so the idea of risk and reasonable risk. And in my mind, when, especially when it comes to technology, these these innovations come to market so quickly it's they're they're being developed so fast that we can't really take this old school style of regulation and apply it to the digital world because you can iterate you can you know a weekend of of the engineers doing some work and it can be a totally different tool so we do need to have this kind of this viewpoint of okay what is too much risk what is reasonable risk for a tool like this to be implemented in healthcare. So that's one area. So like the regulatory side. And then the other side is the paying for side. I am one of those people in my mind when I think about it, like as long as the as long as the price fits within the budget and stuff like that, I'm much more apt to try a new technology, try a new innovative tool if it means we can save money in other areas or save time in other areas, increase efficiency, but also improve that clinical experience and not necessarily waiting for the ability to to bill for it, right? Now, some things are just out of this world ex- expensive, and the clinicians and the organizations need a really quick ROI or a, a reasonable ROI in order to implement a tool, and that's one thing. But there are plenty areas, especially the, the people that I know and I work with a lot, when, back when I was working with healthcare organizations, were privately held outpatient rehab facilities or chiropractors or things like that, like, there are things that you can implement in your practice that don't require a huge investment, but that do provide a lot of benefit and value to the patients or the clients that you serve and give you increased efficiency. So whether or not you're in this, you know, most people are this fee for service healthcare model where you're counting time and you're billing CPT codes, even if you can't bill a CPT code for some of these, for using some of these tools, if it makes you more efficient, then you still are able to recapture the time that you would have spent otherwise, right? So I'm a big fan of looking at ways, 
especially in independent healthcare organizations where you can implement a technology or tool to improve communication with clinicians and between clinicians and, and clients or patients and improve clinical outcomes while increasing efficiency. Then once you've got that in place, then you can look at other things like lump sum reimbursements or global payment schemes or, or other value-based arrangements. And if you're building upon a culture or a, a organizational culture of implementing new technologies and innovating, it makes it very, not very easy, but it makes it easier to adopt or to take a risk on some of these different payment models because you know you're not going to lose your shirt on it. One of the biggest problems I see talking with either other clinic owners that I that I bump into on the street and we, we chit-chat or, um, or other uh, clients of mine working in the healthcare technology space, maybe they have a startup, or maybe they have a, a device or something like that, is this idea like we're going to take – we're going to move into value-based reimbursement schemes, but we're going to do it the same way we, we handle fee-for-service patients, right? So a, a good example in the physical therapy world where I'm at is like the whole scheduling piece, right? Oh, everybody gets seen two times a week for six weeks, and that's just the way we do it. And that is profitable, and that works, and the patient can get good clinical outcomes doing that um, in a fee-for-service model. However, if you're getting paid a lump sum of money, for you know treating a patient with acute shoulder bursitis or a rotator cuff impingement or something like that one the incentives kind of skew right you want to treat this person you want to get them as as fast as you can in as short of a time as you can because anything that you save essentially if you were normally treating patients with this shoulder dysfunction for 12 visits and now you're able to treat them in eight visits well those extra four visits that you were already paid for in some cases are is becoming pure profit right so that is a big thing being able to leverage that technology to do that and really look at those those other payment schemes not as we're going to accept this and we're going to try to make it work based of our, our off our normal operations in a fee for service model but really looking at innovating your practice and by extension some of these things will carry over into those fee for service patients as well like oh we've discovered that we can treat effectively treat this shoulder condition you know on average in four visits less than we have traditionally been doing it because of you know we're implementing this technology here this tool here or whatever it is and that means that maybe some of these patients that we were counting on seeing for 16 visits, we're now seeing for 12 visits. And on the surface, people are freaking out like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do to make up the visits? The reality is if referral sources see that, they're going to be happy and they're going to refer you more patients. If patients see that, they're going to refer you to more of their friends and family members. And it's a good marketing tool to, to improve on. So we a good example that we have at the clinic is like, I want to say last time I looked at the numbers, it was like the average number of um, physical therapy visits after like, I can't remember if it was a total knee replacement or a scope or something like that across the nation was like 23, which to me is like super high. I'm like, that's a, that's a lot of visits for, for physical therapy, especially if you think like, okay, insurance reimbursement, even if you're on the high end is like in the hundred, $103 a visit, like you're talking $2,300 to, to treat that patient. In our clinic, after running the numbers for the last just year to date, we're doing it at 14.4, which is a big difference, a, a huge difference in my mind. And we're using that and we're going to refer, like every doctor that we know that refers to us that has sent us these, these knee surgery patients. And we're saying, look, the national average is this, we're treating them in this, here's the data to prove it, right? Um, and it's also um, helpful in managing some of these lump sum payment uh, payers that we have at uh, on the books here that a lot of the local providers don't want to deal with because they they lose money on them they only give you so much money per visit because we've implemented some of these tools and technologies in our clinic um, we know that we're able to manage them efficiently so we we take them <laughs> and we're not losing our shirt on it so but part of that comes from one understanding the data being able to follow the data track the data and use that data to make clinical decisions and treatment decisions but then also having this idea of implementing technology not to double down on old business models or treatment models but really using it to innovate in either the way care is delivered communicated provided to the patient. So anyways, that's a long story, a long ramble on that topic. It's something that I, I think a lot about and I think um, 
there's a, I get excited about because I think there's a lot of opportunity there for clinicians to really differentiate themselves by leveraging technology as a force multiplier for clinical efficiency, for clinical outcomes, and then also using that to drive business for their organization. So that's all I've got to say about that. If you are listening to this and you want to develop an effective, succinct, and unique positioning strategy for your healthcare organization, um, your company, your technology device or SaaS company, um, then check out the Positioning Alignment Workshop, what we call the Healthcare Positioning Alignment Workshop, where we help you say the right thing to the right healthcare audience. Um, you can find more about that at positioning.rehabupracticesolutions.com. But basically, we help you answer the question, value to whom, so that you can develop an effective value proposition. So obviously, if you've been uh, listening to the show for any length of time, you know we talk about the four different stakeholders of healthcare a lot, right? The payer, the provider, the policymaker, and the patient. So depending on who you're marketing to, those different stakeholders have different perspectives that determine what they consider valuable and the outcomes that they, they're seeking from a technology device, a provider organization, what have you. By narrowing down the value to whom question, you have a clear idea of how your service, your technology, your device, insert whatever you're doing, is position to solve the problems faced by those specific stakeholders that you're targeting within the healthcare industry. So again, if you want to learn more about that, we do this with a lot of clients. Um, you can, it's a, it's basically 90 minutes. We sit down, we strategize. Um, we come up with a good positioning strategy or uh, a positioning document, if you would, for your specific company, your, your service, your, your provider organization, or your technology company. Um, then we have a follow-up meeting where we kind of debrief about it, and then there's some some uh, guidance and stuff as you implement some of your business development strategy as well. But if you want to learn more about that, you can go to positioning.rehabupracticesolutions.com to learn more. So that's positioning.rehab, the letter U, practicesolutions.com, and learn more about the Healthcare Positioning Alignment Workshop. All right, that is all I've got this week. So if you like the show... Find a friend, a colleague, a coworker that you think would benefit from or find this topic or to find this, uh, this show entertaining and share it with them. Just send them the link. Say, hey, I, th I listened to this. I thought you might like it. Um, it helps people find the show. And in my, in my mind, that's kind of what I want. I, I don't necessarily – I mean, yeah, I care about the iTunes ratings and all that. We've got five stars. That's wonderful. Um, and I care about that kind of stuff. But really, I'm in this to help drive this message of – impacting healthcare innovation and it really humanizing healthcare through through the innovation that we're bringing to the table. So, um, and that's really best done in my mind on those one-on-one -on -one referral relationships. So if you've got a friend, a colleague, someone in the space that you think would, uh, would be interested or open to the idea, shoot them a link. Uh, it doesn't even need to be to this episode. We've covered, this is episode 110. We have 109 other episodes that cover everything from uh, direct service delivery, evidence-based practice, like some of the, the businessy side of things, mergers and acquisitions, uh, scheduling and clinical operations. We've got a lot of it. So anyways, that would be, that'd be great. So until the next time, be healthy, be safe. I will talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Better Outcome Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Our hope is that you walk away from each episode informed, equipped, and empowered to push the boundaries in your own practice or business. We want to give you the tools to help you build strong, long-lasting relationships with your patients and clients, helping meet their goals, improve their health, and achieve better outcomes. Learn more at www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.